Hello, everybody. My name is Susanna Lam. Today, I'm going to be talking about U.S. individual tax brackets. And um, I will get into my present presentation shortly. But I just wanted to let you know that uh, I want to thank you for uh, spending some time with me and uh, following uh, me and my channel to learn more about taxation. Um, I feel in life, in everything that we do, whether we plan to win a marathon or we train for a marathon, or we want to get that dream job that we have, uh, always wanted, um, we should always be prepared and be informed. Um, the same thing with wealth building and um, uh, financial planning. Oh, um, we all work very hard for our money. And so instead of uh, uh, paying uh, without knowing the tax code, it's always important to learn a few things about the tax law so that uh, we could take advantage of the tax code uh, like the rich and the famous do, right? The tax codes are written for everybody, not just for the rich or the famous or the wealthy. Um, individuals um, in the middle class families could also utilize the same tax laws. Uh, so I'm here to help to uh, provide information to inform you. If you have any questions uh, for me, feel free to uh, make comments or uh, directly below, below the screen here. And also um, feel free to email us with any future uh, topics uh, that you'd like to be covered, okay? So before I start my pre presentation, I'd like to share with you my, my PowerPoint presentation uh, because again, this is not just a show, this is actually an educational opportunity. So I wanna come and share the information well prepared. So let me go ahead and do that. Okay, can you see? Can you see? Okay. Now. So before we start this presentation, I want to um, show you the disclaimer and you can take some time to read the disclaimer. Basically, all I'm saying is that even though I'm sharing some tax knowledge with you, with the world, uh, Americans as well as non-Americans, these are for general knowledge only. It's not meant to be a tax advice or financial advice in order for you to implement any of the tax planning ideas that I have here in this channel, it has to have a written permission from, from me or from my firm, basically telling you that, yes, based on your personal situation, you may use these tax planning ideas to your advantage. Otherwise, it will be just your general knowledge and um, it may or may not fit your personal situation. That's the reason why you need to have a professional like myself or any tax CPAs out there who could also help you. Now, if your CPAs are not aware of certain tax planning ideas that I'm presenting here or I will be presenting or I have presented in the past, feel free to send this link over to that person and he or she can consult or um, you know, talk to me or you know, I'll, I'll be happy to work with your CPAs as well, okay? Um, so now that we get the disclaimer out of the way, here you go. So I always like to start my presentation with a joke, okay? So the IRS, there's, isn't that funny? The husband turns to the wife and says, like the sign says, it's all theirs. <laughs> this is meant to be a joke only, okay? <laughs> Not all of your money will go to the IRS. Although at some point in our history, that was the case. Alrighty. So let's start the presentation, shall we? 
So the US tax prep, individual tax prep, I should be exact, is a pretty simple process. For me, it's a six step process. Now, why is it a six step process? Because this, this is like how I think, okay? And I'd like to share with you how the way that I think about the US tax prep process. Number one is you will determine what your filing status is. And right now there are five filing status in the US, whether you are single, you are married, filing joint with your spouse, or third, you are married, but you decide to file separately from your spouse. And number four, you are head of household. And number five, you're a widow or a widow, and you got to have a child. So therefore, it's called a qualifying widow or widower. Okay, those are the five income tax status that are available in the US right now. Now, once your filing status is determined, then you're gonna figure out your AGI, your adjusted gross income. So that's step number two. Then in step number three, once you figure out what your AGI is, then you're gonna determine, you're gonna determine if you should use a standard deduction or an itemized deduction. Whichever way will yield the least amount of tax liability for you. Okay, so that's step number three. Now, step number four is you're going to figure out what your tax liability is based on your taxable income that you just figured out in step number three. And it's a table, I mean, literally, it's a table that shows, okay, if you make this much income, then your tax is going to be this much. And I'm going to go into the detail later on. Then step number five is you figure out, okay, well, this is my tax liability in step four, but the IRS has withheld some taxes from my W-2, my paychecks, right? So now I need to figure out how much I owe or how much they owe me, okay? So that would be step number five. And the result of that step is step number six. If it's a positive number, then you owe the IRS some money. But if it's a negative number, meaning if your tax liability in step four is less than the amount in step five, the amount of taxes that have been withheld from your paychecks during the year. Therefore, in step number six, the result would be a negative number, correct? If it's a negative number, that means you're gonna get a refund from the IRS. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, for me as a tax CPA, I always advise my client to owe the IRS a couple hundred dollars when they file their taxes. In other words, in a perfect scenario, if in step six, if you end up owing the IRS a few hundred bucks, like, or maybe $20, $40, $50, then you have done your tax planning correctly. Does that make sense? You're not giving too much money to the IRS during the year. You can actually take all those amounts of money and then invest somewhere else. Because if you think about it, the IRS does not give you seven, eight, nine percent in interest on the money that they withheld from your paycheck. So you don't want to be in a situation where you give too much money to the IRS. Now, I understand, I understand those of you who've gone to different tax preparers and if they give you a biggest tax refund and you will be like, yeah, that's, that's not the right mindset, okay? You don't want to have the biggest refund when you file your taxes with the IRS, period. Because all it means is that you have lent your money, which rightfully belongs to you, 
to the IRS pretty much interest free because that, that's not going to pay you 8% in interest. Therefore, you want to be able to actively manage your money, your wealth, by determining how much in taxes you're going to owe the government up front in a way such that when you file your taxes, you either owe them a little bit, a tiny bit of money, and then you write them a check. So it's, you're not going to be broke after you write a check to the IRS on April 15th, right? But you don't want to get like a $5,000 refund, or you want to get like $60,000 refund, or you don't want to get like even like $2,000 or $1,000 refund. Does that make sense to you? So I hope this education has helped you kind of shift your mindset a little bit about tax planning, okay? So for those of you who have always had a big refund when you file your taxes, uh, maybe because you have um, child's tax credit, right? Which is not being taken into account when you do your W-4 uh, withholding paperwork. Um, so you may want to take that into consideration because if you if you have two thousand dollars of tax return time um, and you spread it out over the twelve month period, every month you get some extra money. And then you take that money, you invest into a an investment vehicle that will give you six seven percent in interest. Now you're actually making money work very hard for you, right? And Again, I want you to think about ways that you can make your money work harder for you as opposed to you working hard for money. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So, so step number five, I talked about that. And then step number six, you want to get a small refund or you owe the IRS a little bit of money. Not a whole lot, just a little bit, maybe $20 maybe $40, $50, I don't know, okay? But um, try, try, try to do that. And of course, you gotta involve the help of a professional like myself in order for you to do that. All right, so now that you understand the six step process, let me go ahead and introduce to you something that's very new. And I don't think a lot of people out there know this information. And I don't think there are a lot of CPAs out there talking to their clients about this stuff either, right? And I, I think it's, um, it's always good to understand where the sources of all the tax information that you've heard about. Um, the reason for that is because, you know, you care about your money, right? And so whoever tells you, okay, well, the tax laws is this, and you go, okay, well, show me the source, okay? So before I go into the tax table, I'm going to show you the source of what I'm about to be discussing later on today in this presentation. So every year, the IRS issues a revenue procedure, and we professional always call it a REF PROC for short, to basically notify taxpayers of New Year's annual inflation, tax adjustments, and all of that. Now for 2021, which is the year that we're in, the prep proc number is the 2020-45. And the number 45 here is actually a um, in the sequential order because during the year, the IRS has issued a lot of prep procs. Therefore, they have to use a, a number, right? One, two, three, four, five. And this happens to be number 45. And this particular prep proc has 28 pages. Yes. That's how lengthy those tax adjustments are for 2021. No wonder nobody could keep up with all the changes in the tax laws. And that's why people need professionals like us, whose job is to do this, right? To read 28 pages of this rep proc every single year. Okay, now believe it or not, in 2021, which is this year, we only have a rep proc issued for 2022. So you know what the tax rates and adjustments are going to be for 2022. And so for those of you who are 
very, very determined in keeping your taxes low for 2022, right? Now you should be talking to your tax CPA about ways to utilize that new information. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so now we're in December in 2021 right now, but for those of you who think about the future, right, do proper tax planning, this is a time, maybe this is kind of too late because I always advise my clients to be thinking about this every quarter, okay? Every three months, call me, talk to me. I'll be happy to sit down with you and do some tax planning, right? Some people wait until the very last minute, like literally the 31st of December, and usually I'm out on the 31st of December, so I can't help you. But for those of you who think about this year round, just know that even though we're in 2021, we already have tax adjustments for 2022, okay? Um, and uh, write me an email if you wanna know what it is. All right, so in 2021, there are 20, um, 21, there are seven tax brackets. Um, just remember, these tax brackets are not always at number seven, okay? Depending on who's in the White House, who knows? In 16 years, in eight years, in four years, in two years, who knows, right? And so just keep that in mind. Um, I cannot stress enough about this. Yes, you understand there are seven tax brackets in 2021. If you are not in a reactive mode all the time, like, re, like you just react to what happening to you, right? Instead of planning ahead, okay? Uh, then you only think about the present. But if you want to think about the future, then you want to see the historical tax brackets in prior years, just to get a little bit of an idea how it might turn out to be in the future. Does that make sense to you? Anybody out there? So, now, why is this extremely important? It's extremely important because if you go back to my episode number one, which basically talks about the differences between tax planning and tax reporting, okay? And the basic tax structure of um, tax planning, you are able, and there are four of them, and you may want to go back to my first episode, whatever, right? I mean, it's right there in the channel. But there are four basic framework, one of which is the allocation of family income. Okay, you might you as parents, you might be at a higher tax bracket than your children who are in a lower tax bracket. So now if you know ahead what the tax brackets are gonna be in 2022, now is the time for you, now meaning December 2021, is the time for you to sit down with your CPA and start talking about ways to allocate your family income going forward in 2022. Now, all of that is totally legal. I'm not saying that it's illegal, okay? But maybe um, your kids are going off to college in about a few years and um, they need to have more savings in their college um, savings account. They need to work more hours, for example, okay? Um, so allocation of family income is one of the things that you could do in terms of uh, uh, managing the tax table or tax bracket. Or number two, if you want to convert your IRA into a Roth IRA, okay, and you still want to be in the same tax bracket, you wanna know and you want to master, master this tax table. That's the only reason why you want to learn about this stuff, okay? You don't want to be in a situation where you convert your IRA into a Roth and then you realize, oops, because I did that, now I'm in a higher tax bracket and I'm not prepared mentally to pay the IRS more money based on this conversion that I just did, okay? Now, number three, maybe you can decide to, to pay your bills before you end to reduce your taxable income, okay? and take advantage of your understanding and your learning 
of this topic that I'm going to be presenting today. And then perhaps you may want to purchase a new vehicle, right? Or maybe you want to put on the roof a, a brand new solar panel because of the energy efficient credit, right? Um, so those are the few things that you could do before the end. Um, but in order for you to know whether or not what you are about to do will reduce your tax liability, you got to understand the tax table. And that's the reason why I am talking about this today. All right, so I'm going to give you an example for a couple, family, husband and wife. And I choose this example because it's applicable for me and for most Americans out there who are married um, with two kids, right? That's a typical scenario in America. So here is an example of a tax table, okay? So I know some of you are like, oh my gosh, you know, I am feeling busy already with all these numbers, okay? But let me assure you, it's not that complicated, okay? So I'm going to go over this step-by-step step for you. And remember, how many filing starters are there? Five. Five, okay? So from the five, I picked this filing status married filing joint to illustrate to you what the tax table looks like for a married couple who decide to file a joint tax return. Okay. Now, if your taxable income is not over $20,000, $20,550, your tax rate is 10%, 10% taxable income. Now, if you remember taxable income is uh, what step? Step number three, right? In the six step process. So if your taxable income is less than $20,550, your tax rate is 10%. If your Oops, that's a typo here. It's not 19,900. Okay. But from uh, 20,550, okay, here's a typo. It's 19,900, not 20,550. That's for 2022. Okay, but if your income falls between 19,900 and not over 81,050, then your tax is 1,990 plus 12% of the excess over 19,900. Are you confused yet? Okay, I'm gonna go over some example for you, for you to understand, okay? So basically the US tax code is not a fixed tax rate. It's not like, okay, if you make $81,000, then your tax is going to be 12% on that $81,000. No, it's not like that. The way it works is that if you make $21,000, I'm going to use a rounded number, okay? $81,000 that you make as taxable income, okay? Now, gross income is taxable income. And there's a difference between gross income and taxable income. But let's just say your taxable income is $81,000, okay? The first $19,900 is going to be subject to a 10% tax rate. Make sense to everybody? Okay. And then anything above this $19,900 would be taxed at a 12% tax rate. Does it make sense to you? So let's just say you make $19,901. $19,900 will be taxed at 10%. And that $1 is being taxed at 12%. Does it make sense? Okay. It's a progressive, right? Progressive. It's like a, like a, like a ladder, right? The more income you make, and they give you an amount like the ceiling for that bracket. And once you hit that ceiling, you're going to go up to the next tax bracket. They call it a progressive tax table. Okay. So it's not a straight fixed percentage. Now let's just say your entire family, husband and wife 
working and your taxable income is 172, right? This amount right here, 172,750. So, you know, right away, your tax liability is 9,328 and anything above 81,050 will be subject to a 22% tax rate. So it doesn't mean 22% on the 172, it's 22% on anything over 81,050, right? And so on and so forth. So let's just say in the Silicon Valley in California, it's very typical for a professional family of two husband and wife working as engineers to be making $400,000, okay? So they would be in this tax bracket right here, okay? Say 400,000, let's just say 418,850, okay? So they know they owe the IRS $67,206 and anything above 329,580 would be taxed at 32% tax rate. Make sense, everybody? So if, if you are making 418,000, you don't take 418,850 multiplied by 32. No, that's not how that works. Only the first 20, uh, 19,000, sorry, here's a typo, it should be 19,900 is subject to a 10%. And then anything above that, is at 12%. And then anything above that would be 22%, right? So it's like a step ladder. You see what I'm saying? All right. So now let's say that you're like a CFO or a CEO of a company in the Silicon Valley. And between you and your wife, both of you make $628,300. Okay, you know, you're gonna owe $168,993.50. And anything above that, okay, will be taxed at 37%. Make sense? So let's just say you make $700,000. Okay, $700,000 between the husband and the wife. Then you know you owe the IRS $168,000 and then 37% on the difference between $700,000 and the $628,300. Make sense, everybody? All right. Whoa. I hope you're not confused yet. Are you? Are you confused yet? All right. So let's go over some example. Okay. So husband and wife work for ABC company. Each brings home a W-2. So they are both working. They are employees. They do not have a small business to run. And then in box one, of the husband's W-2, it shows $100,000. So he makes $100,000 per year. And then for the wife, the wife shows $150,000, $140,000 in her W-2. And then in box two of their paycheck, it shows a $13,000 of federal tax withholding or withheld for the husband and $14,000 for the wife. So now let's apply what we just learned. Okay. So the husband makes $100,000. The wife makes $140,000. Right? Okay. So that total gross income is $240,000. In this case, let's just say the standard deduction would give them 
a better answer. So we're going to use that. So the standard deduction is 25,900. And we're going to figure out what the AGI is going to be. In this case, it's 214,100. All right, so now here comes the fun part. So based on this AGI of 214, 100, so let's go back. Everybody wrote that down? 214, 100 being the AGI. Let's just say they have no children, no credits, none of that. Okay, just of a plain vanilla. Standard deduction of 25,900. So what's the, what's the tax? Well, 29,502. Let's see if we can go back. Right here. Right? Because they're making 214,000. So 214 falls into this area right here. Okay, so between 172 and 329. So right away they know they owe $29,502. Now anything above this number, 172,750, would be taxed at what percentage? 24%, right? So and that's why you see this, 41,350 multiplied by 24%, which gives you 9,924. So if you add this number, 29,502 and 9,924, 9,924, you get 39,426. Oh my goodness, there are so many numbers here. Now, for those of you who get dizzy, every time you see numbers, I hope you are still around, okay? But like, hang in there with me, hang in there, because you can totally get this, okay? Because it's really, it's just multiplication, some addition, some subtraction, it's not even algebra. Okay, so it's like super, super, super easy. So now they know they owe 39,426. And let's call it A, okay, which is step number five in my six step process. Now, step number six is this one right here 12,426. And how did I get to this number? I got to this number because I took what I figured out from the tax table, which is this number, and I subtract from that the amount of taxes that has been withheld by the IRS in step five, which is 27,000, right? And where did I get the 27,000? I got this from here in box two, right, in box, Two of husband W-2, it shows a 13,000 of federal tax withheld. And in the wives W-2, it shows 14,000. So I just add these two numbers together to get to 27. Are you with me so far? Okay, so in this case, they owe the IRS 12,426. Now, a lot of the time I get clients who are, who are very, very angry at me because I prepare their tax returns showing an amount due. They think it's my fault that I don't know how to prepare taxes. Like, why do I have to pay the IRS money, like that much money? I don't have 12,000 to pay to the IRS. Well, here's the reason. Maybe when you fill out your W-4, now, before you start your job, it's your responsibility to tell your employer how much 
your employer should withhold from your paycheck taxes that you think you're going to owe the IRS. I know, I know. They want you to do some guesswork, right? So you did your best. So you thought you owe the IRS 27000 between the husband and the wife. So that's how much your employer withheld from your paycheck. But when you actually filed your return, it turns out that you owe them 39426 And that's the reason why you owe the IRS 12426 Does it make sense to you? It's not the tax preparer's fault that they somehow make a mistake on your tax return. Although that does happen from time to time, okay? But typically, if you end up owing a lot of money at tax return time, most likely you need to go back to your employer and fix your W-4. Okay, and most likely you're gonna have to work closely with your CPA to figure out what the correct amount of withholding should be for the upcoming year. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so it's not a very, very good answer. Unfortunately, unfortunately for this couple, owing <laughs> the IRS $12,000 is no fun, especially when you are living hand to mouth, you don't have any savings and you can barely make it, okay? So I hope this example shows you how a six-step uh, six tax prep process looks like, okay? From step number one to step number six. You can hold your questions until the very end.